G'day guys, welcome back to Supercoach with DR and welcome to the round nine stock market video. I'm a little bit glassy-eyed right in the middle of report writing at this stage, but I do apologize for getting this out late. I was meant to get it out Wednesday afternoon, but obviously it's getting close to midnight Wednesday and I'm not sure how long it's going to take to upload. So hopefully not too long and it'll be out at least by Thursday morning. So firstly, hope that you're all well, hope that you had an awesome round. I was lucky enough to be invited on to George's channel with my good mate Spills for a Q&A podcast a couple of nights ago where we do discuss a lot of these relevant players that I'll be talking about in the stock market video. So if you want to go and check that out for a more in-depth discussion between the three of us on some of these different players, make sure that you do that. I will put a link in the description. So thanks, George. It was awesome to uh, have a great chat with you and Spills, mate. But for this week, the stock market, it's a bit of an interesting one because we don't have a lot of great downgrade options. I'm talking in the 117, 123K type range, but we do have a few fallen premiums. So, you know, you've got your Dusty Martin, even someone like a Jordan Ridley's coming down a little bit. Rowan Marshall, unfortunately, we'll have to trade him out. A big question this week is Tommy Powell. Do we cut him or do we keep him? through his buy so we can cover for the couple of tough ones. So there's lots of questions going into this week. I don't know if I've got all the answers, but we'll certainly discuss all of the relevant players. So let's get straight into it, guys. You know where we start, 500K plus defenders. Now, I don't know too many teams without this man at the top of the 500K plus defender list this week. It's Rory Laird, 525,100. An average of 105, three round average, two points more at a 107, break even of 68. He's looking to rise about 15,000 this week if he can just go above the ton. So clearly, I think the best buy for this round. Look, he's had a bit of a disappointing season. Look, for my, I suppose, projections and expectations for Rory Laird in 2021, he's gone a little bit below par, but... Look, there's a long way to go in the season, and I'm hoping that his recent form over the last couple of weeks will continue on for the rest of this season that we have in front of us. So I love the pick, Rory Laird. If for some reason you don't have him, oh, look, he's got that terrible buy, doesn't he? Yeah, look, I just think you get him in anyway, Rory Laird. Sam Doherty, I can't deny him anymore. I've got to respect it. Three-round average of 113, break-even of 72. I think you can just get him into your side. You know, with the way that he's going at the moment, uh, you know, Newman had absolutely no effect on him whatsoever on the weekend. You know, a projected score of 111, that'll send him up about 17K. I just think he's one of those pods in our defensive lines that not many teams have that, yeah, I don't know how to describe it. Like, I've, I haven't got a lot of love for the pick, but I have to endorse it. It's it, He's a bit of a tough one, Sam Doherty. Just not a name that I, I sort of look at personally but I, I just yeah i can't deny it anymore i've got to give him the respect and there's really nothing else to do but endorse him with the numbers that i've been looking at so if you want to get in an ultra pod then you could go sam doherty but at the same price basically i'd much rather go tommy stewart down the bottom uh, jack crisp just you know a point of note you know 13 out of 19 cbas over the weekend so really playing through that midfield Richie, love this guy as a selection. 44% of the kick-ins over the weekend. I just think that from week to week, he'll give you reliable scores. He kicks the ball, kicks it well. I'm just on repeat with Rich, so I won't bore you with that again. But yeah, I've been recommending him for, geez, must be six weeks now, I think. Callum Mills, this is the ideal pick, I think, to have in your defensive lines. That's why I've got to buy now. Break even of 92 isn't the lowest that you'll ever see, but... At the same time, if you're going right for that round 14 buy, I just think that this is a bloke out of any defender that I don't have anyway that I would love to have in my side. So Callum Mills, a midfielder, has been super this year. And um, yeah, if you can get him in, if it works for you, then I certainly do recommend it. Luke Ryan, just been you know injured. Yeah, wouldn't look to go there. Christian Salem, now had a fair conversation about this bloke uh, with Jordan Spills. The other night so won't go right into that again but basically what we said was at the same price point you've really got some safer and more reliable options we talked that you know last year his best score for the whole season was a 116 
Certainly different year, different role. We, we all understand that. Melbourne are flying at the moment, but we don't know what he's going to score like in losses. We haven't seen a loss. Do we expect a loss? Look, I'm not too sure, but there's still a few question marks, I think, with the Salem pick. As much as, yeah, I respect what he's done and the numbers speak for themselves. You know, a three-rounder and a season average of 107, terrific. Remember, he did have a really big score that really did boost that up as well, so it would be close to that 100 mark without that, but we, it's it's too easy to say, isn't it, just take it out, you know, you've got to, you know, give him credit and, and note that score, so look, for me, no, because I'd much rather, as I said, get your Mills, Stewart's, Whitfield when he bottoms out, your Seagulls, but an Ultrapod, if that's what you want, you can go for Salem, I think. The Seagull took half of the kick-ins over the weekend, I always like this pick, so for me, he's pretty much a buy it now whenever you want, whenever it works for you. Same as Tommy Stewart, but look, if you look at the break even, it is 138 at the same time, I think Spills is highly considering bringing Tommy in this week because he is such a safe option. Last couple of weeks may have disappointed some, almost got to the ton, not quite, but if you look at his game, I still think that he played fine games the last fortnight, so not worried at all about Tommy, but you can probably get him in at a cheaper price, certainly next week. I don't think that he's got a 138 in him. Look, he might. Uh, we've seen a high score from that this year already, but uh, ideally, you'd probably wait a week. But if you want quality and you've got the cash, uh, you might have a Jack Bowes, for example, then Tom Stewart could be a man. And Lockie Whitfield, certainly at the moment, just watch this man. Just watch him because he's a little bit rusty, but he'll work his way into it. Guarantee you he'll work his way into it and he'll be at a pretty juicy price. So hopefully right after his buy, He'll be at, you know, well, I'm hoping mid 400s. That'd be absolutely ideal. But anywhere sort of under the 500k mark and you see a little bit of form from Whitfield, I'd be jumping all over this pick. I think he will be a great selection, Lockie Whitfield. Just a little bit rusty at the moment, but we certainly cannot forget this man's talent. So, yeah, look, these are the blokes, the type of players, I think, that I would be looking to bring into your side. But, yeah, you might want to go with a couple more of the value picks. I don't know, but the players like, I suppose, Laird, Doherty, Rich Mills, Ava Salem, Lloyd, Stewart, and Whitfield, eventually, I think, these are the type of blokes that you want to finish your side with in an ideal world if you've got the cash. On to the defenders, 250 to 500k. Bloody Mason Redmond, bugger off, would you, mate, with your kick-in percentage, 45%. You know, what's happened here, you know? Ridley, one of the best kicks in the competition, is now losing his kickouts to Mason Redmond. So I'm not happy with Mason. And uh, look, just do the right thing and throw that ball to Jordan to give him a few more kickouts, please, Mace. Because, yeah, it, it's really frustrating, particularly for Ridley owners. I just didn't see this coming. It's after that concussion, things have just gone downhill. Uh, look, we will talk about... Ridley, obviously, we will get to him, but uh, yeah, just not happy with this man at all. James Harms, bit of a pod selection, you know, 93 for an average at 377. Again, just got that round 14 by, pretty tough. I think I wouldn't look to endorse this selection. Darcy Moore took 40% of the kick-ins on the weekend. He's back to that defensive role, a break-even, a low break-even of 16 for that three-round average. But if you look at that three-round average at 76, yeah, still not terrific. Uh, so I wouldn't look to endorse his pick. Like a Harms, they're basically at the same price. Break even's very similar as well. Both round 14 by players, unfortunately. Jordan Clark, chop him, keep him. I don't know, just I got him out of my side a long time ago and it felt pretty good. Um, yeah, don't know why he'd sort of still be holding on to Clark, to be quite honest. Uh, Oled Markov is a trap. Look, I did watch him over the weekend. Really exciting, right? Gets a lot of the ball and just doesn't use it well, unfortunately. So, uh, yeah, not the cleanest type player. Exciting type player. Loves to break the lines. And do you know what? I still thought that he was one of their better players on the night because he tried bloody hard. He ran hard. And I had a lot of respect for his game. Just couldn't finish off his good work. And, uh, look, his teammates at stages didn't help him as well. So pretty solid game from Oleg on the weekends, but can't endorse him at 420k. Braden Maynard, so I've got a new symbol here. You know, a real change in form. His three-round average is now 100. If you checked out the stock market videos for the first three weeks, he was right down there, you know, with an average around the 60s. It was just a terrible start 
to the season from Maynard. But look, he's one of those real pod selections that is starting to hit a little bit more form. You could really rely on him last year, really broke out last year. And many people thought that he could really continue that form and have really solid 2021 campaign. We haven't seen that at the start of the year, but recently we have started to see some really positive signs. But I can't endorse it uh, with, with the buy at this stage. I keep on re- repeating it. I'm sorry, but you know you just got to remind you about when these players do have it. Uh, Jack Scrimshaw, I've got the trap on because look at 430,000, there's just better options than Jack Scrimshaw. He does have a three round average of 100, which is the second highest or the equal second highest on this list along with Braden Maynard. But uh, look, if you get him in now, he's got that early buy. The timing just isn't right, I don't think. And the pick just isn't right and doesn't make sense to me personally. So that's why I've got the trap there. Don't look to go near him. Uh, Cozzy, look, I think it's probably time. That break even should be in red. Sorry, it's in the green because it's one point over his three-round average. But uh, yeah, look, I think it is time. You could probably go another week on him, depending on th- how you think he'll go this week. But the trouble is that you've probably got, yeah, only a couple of blokes that you could trade him down to and you have to pay up a little bit more for them, unfortunately. So it's a bit of an awkward week for Cozzy owners. You'd probably, in an ideal world, world sorry, look to go up, I think. Take Caleb Daniel now also had a fair bit of discussion about this bloke. So we all sort of sat on the fence about it, but... The advice that I'd give you is if you've already if you're already running with someone like a Stephen May and a Jath in your defensive lines, then I wouldn't go a Daniel as well. I think adding someone like a Daniel who still does have some question marks, don't get me wrong, certainly does have some upside as well. If you look at that three round average, for example, compared to the break even, it's close to being doubled. So certainly upside there at his price point, what he's been putting out lately, but certainly still are some question marks with the Daniel selection. So I certainly don't hate it. But yeah, it's pretty risky if you're already running with a couple of other questionable defenders at this stage. But if you've got, you know, your Mills, Seagulls, Stewarts, uh, you know, Laird, these type of players who have been pretty reliable during the season, then even you know, even a Doherty, I suppose you could be close to put in that category now, then I think it's okay to grab him, I think. Uh, but he's been terrific for us as a rookie. Yeah, look, you could hold him up until the buys. Nothing wrong with that. But again, if you can use him to go up to one of the picks, preferably on the page before, then yeah, I think you can go for it. And Orazio, yeah, time to go Orazio, I think. Looking to lose some cash if he goes around 55. Who knows what he'll score, what are your projections? You'll probably have to ask yourself that if you're an owner and then make the decision. But yeah, I'd certainly look to have him on the chopping block this week. Liam Baker played a good game through the midfield on the weekend. I wouldn't consider him, though. Certainly a pot option. With, though, 80% of the kick-ins, that's Ridley-like numbers before the concussion, but still don't really love the selection there. Blake Hardwick, gee, this bloke deserves a fair bit of respect. Now with a season average in three figures. I don't think many would have been projecting this one from the start of the season. So 100 on the season now with a three-round average of 106, break-even of 68, isn't he the ultimate pod? 60% of the kick-ins over the weekend. They're projecting him to go a 109. He'll go up 17K and rise above the 500K mark and join the list of players such as his Stewart's, Lloyd's, Mills, etc. So, yeah, super solid season from Blake Hardwick so far. Look, ideally, he'd be at this break-even the week after his buy if you're looking for an ultra pod, but it's an awkward time to get him in. Yeah, I'd just look for a safer option. CJ, is he on the chopping block? Now, I've got the question mark there. I'm sort of asking the question myself because he's a hard pick to read. George talked a little bit about him the other night and, uh, you know, in regards to the fact that he hasn't got a lot of different ways to score and at times he can rely on the opposition kicking it badly. So, uh, yeah, that's an interesting point with CJ and depending on what price you got on him, you may think to yourself now, well, look, I've made some cash. There's a fair chance that you'll start to leak a little bit of cash now. Do I just jump onto one of these safer options? Or do I just ride him out for a while and maybe leave him as my last upgrade? Because we've still seen that he can score pretty well. You know, his season averages 
89 and we do need to forgive him over the weekend. Obviously, he spent a little bit of time, <coughs> excuse me, getting the dry throat, um, off the ground, getting tested for concussion. So he came back on and soldiered on pretty well, but uh, pretty poor score. And uh, yeah, team dependent on what you want to do with CJ. Jaden Short, 81% of the kick-ins. This is what we want to see. Beautiful Short. He still didn't translate to an ultra nice score just below the ton but uh yeah shorty with 81 percent i really like that career end average now of 105 yep yeah, nice type of pick shorty but be prepared to get some lower scores jordan ridley so with a break even now of 98 i do have the buy now but you can still watch him i think for another week so that's yeah probably my preference if you're not desperate to get a defender into your side i'd probably just wait the one more week just to make sure he can still go consistently at least above that hundred mark before you get him in but at the same time if you've seen enough already you're happy with that 105 you know what he's done at the start of the season um you can certainly buy him this week i think stephen may 62 percent of the kick-ins over the weekend which is nice look that break even is in the green technically at a 105 but that remember that is compared to his three round average but if you look at the season average 87 been a little bit disappointing over the last couple of weeks mainly given the fact that he was on a 40 plus score at quarter time so got a little bit excited did steve may owners but yeah after that really bright start left a little disappointed at the end of the game hunter clark is a pod but i don't really like him as a selection dan houston i think he's a test for his shoulder so is his shoulder i think it is uh, so not sure if he plays this week. Yeah, he's an option that maybe you could get after his buy if he's fit and healthy as one of your last upgrades. Zach Williams, I just don't like the pick, but I do have the role reversal there, given the fact he spent a fair bit more time in the defensive line there at Carlton. He's just, yeah, been very underwhelming in the midfield, unfortunately for Carlton fans and super coach owners. Alira Lear, it will break even now. Well in the red, 129. Yeah, one of those pods, but you don't look to get him in. And I do have this sell on Jack Bowes. Now, I'm not an owner, and I keep referring to Jaws cause, and, and Spills because we did have a really good discussion for an hour and a half the other night, and they did talk about Bowes, um, George in particular, and yeah, his advice was to trade, mainly also because of the fact that, you know, he has had a bit of a change in role. He's not getting those kick-ins that he was used to getting. Um, you know, Lukosius has gone back, which may have affected him a little bit also. So, yeah, given the fact that he's got that, probably were called a short-term injury i think at this stage i haven't caught up with the exact time frame you'd be thinking two to three most likely obviously the buyers coming up i'd just flip him i think at this stage cut your losses and upgrade to probably one of the blokes that you saw in the 500k plus range or else on this page i'd be going maybe a ridley or a short if you're going anyone and the defenders under 250k now Lockie jones the man at the top is on the bubble but i don't think that he actually plays this week i have included him just in case he does play but i think yeah it's probably unlikely so 139,800. i won't go through the numbers uh, i think he's in over 20 percent of sides already so yeah many people are just hoping hoping that he comes back sooner rather than later but when he does, I think it'd be good to get into your side. Uh, Nick Murray, yeah, he's on the bubble, but don't think he plays. Tommy Highmore, yeah, finally came back last week. Great for that cash gen. Not the best score. Didn't set the world on fire. But uh, I did mention in my round review that Brett Ratton mentioned him and praised him for the fact that he thought he did put his body on the line at some stages. So that's a positive sign, I think, coming from the coach and expecting Highmore to play and maintain his spot in the side for this week at least. Nathan Murphy, so can he go this bloke still? Look, if he comes back, I really like the pick actually. He's a courageous type player, which can be bad because he goes in a little bit hard and he worried about those injury concerns, but he's got a good role. I think his job security is pretty good. I am expecting him to come straight back into the side. I may look like a bit of a goose and he doesn't, but yeah, that's my prediction anyway. That's my strong prediction that Murphy comes straight back in. So do you get him at that price? You'd probably just be tempted to wait another week on Lockie Jones, I think. But yeah, maybe if you're desperate. But yeah, ideally it was not last week, but the week before. And is that ideal given the fact he missed a week? Yeah, maybe. I'm not too sure. But yeah, good player. Great Murphy. Jackson Pryor, 
yeah, really rate this bloke as well. Not from a super coach sense. Now just keep the watch on him. Obviously, he's, he's a real pod type rookie, but he's certainly been playing his role there at Brisbane and have been really happy with him. Doesn't really deserve a lot of discussion because he's not relevant. I haven't really seen a team with him, to be quite honest. But if you have got him, yeah, not a bad pickup in the end. Luke Parks, well, he's just going to be a slow burn, I think. Same as Guthrie, same as Stocker, although Stocker did spend some time in the middle, attended some CBAs. Mansell, I've got the poo symbol on him there because, look, he's played for me, filled in for a couple of weeks, but give me 40-odd type scores. Thanks anyway, but, yeah, I want better than that. And Frederick, well, I've got the Ken Hinckley symbol on him because Kenny just killed this pick, and, oh, damn, isn't, isn't it frustrating? He was looking awesome, looking like he had pretty decent job security because he was performing well. You know, surely he can't lose his spot. But he did and has been absolutely destroyed. This could have been an absolutely wonderful uh, cash grab opportunity if he had uh, kept his spot for four to five weeks. But yeah, he's been ruined by Kenny. Thanks very much, Ken. On to the midfielders, 500k plus. Tally, the man up the top. Well... Yeah, what do you say about this man? He's up, he's down, he's got a three-round average of 119 with a break-even of 75. The lowest break-even out of any of the midfielders, 500k plus this week. Oh, look, I just don't like him, unfortunately. I just think he's a little bit too inconsistent. Even though that three-round average looks really impressive, his season average is only 96. So, not for me, Tim Kelly. Uh, Jelly, now, this is a role reversal by now. So, I'll explain what I've got here. If you think that he's going to maintain his current midfield role, where he's got a three-round average of 124, I think that he is definitely a buy now. But if you think there is a chance that he'll revert back to that forward role, where Leon Cameron has personally said that he likes him there, then I would be very, very cautious, and I would not buy now. So do you trust Leon? That's a question that you've got to ask yourself. Yeah, for me personally, I'm not too sure. Probably not. Toby Green's out, as we know, for a little while. So does Kelly go back there now? Uh, is there a correlation between Lockie Whitfield coming into the side and Josh Kelly playing there as well? Yeah, look, I'm not too sure. But uh, it's a little bit risky for me, but I can see why you'd be tempted. Darcy Parrish. Spills talked a little bit about Darcy Parrish a couple of nights ago. 564,200. Really hasn't slowed up since the Anzac game. I think that was, yeah, the making of Darcy Parrish, a lot more responsibility in there this year. You know, Shield's been out of the side for a long time, for example. So he's really stepped up, a really nice player, but is he going to be within that sort of top eight to 12 bracket? Yeah, probably not, more around the 15 mark, I'd say for me, but the three round average of 119 is really, really nice. If you're looking for an ultra pod, you could 20 out of 22 CBA, so right in there in the thick of things. Uh, Libba, he's a man that's always in the thick of things, isn't he? 520,600. Look, 99 for a season, 102 for the three-rounder. Look, he'll make a little bit of money. His CBAs are obviously up. His role's changed a little bit. More favourable to Libba, I think, since Dunkley's gone out of the side. So if you're looking for a really cheap pod, or when I say really cheap, still 520, but if you're looking for a different player, I suppose that you could, but surely you couldn't get him in over your bond who we're going to talk about now, or his teammate, Jack McRae. But the Bond, look, I'll tell you what, scores 92, 145, 82, and then this is his last six weeks. A 116, a 133, a 127, a 107, a 155, and a 128. So Bond now is an absolute must-have. You've got to have this man in your side. He is doing great damage at the moment. Now, the issue for Bont is that he faces St Kilda this week. Jack Steele, traditionally, I think that's been the matchup for Bont. Uh, so does that mean that Steele's game is impacted negatively? Look, we haven't seen Steele play a run with role for a long time now, but is this a game that he does it just to curb his influence? Possibly, I'm not too sure. But yeah, the Bont, I think you could buy him really at any stage. His break even's 92. As a non-Bont and non steel owner, I'm hoping that they just match up and, yeah, none of them score well, so I can hopefully get them at an even better price. But, yeah, fully, fully endorse a Bont. Get him in at any stage. Uh, Jared Lyons now. I fully, fully endorse his pick as well. Absolutely love JL. I've been pumping up his tyres every week, and he continues to reward the 2% of coaches 
that have selected him. You know, spectacular game from him on the weekend. He just loves playing his old mob. I think he likes to remind them that they decided to let him go for nothing. Yeah, he must give Suns fans nightmares because he's one of the toughest and most consistent mids in the comp. We all know that Lockie is out in the short to medium term, and JL has now taken his game to another level, particularly over the last month. You know, there was a seven-second period along the boundary line where Lions had three possessions, just racked up the pill with ease, not a flashy player, you know, the type of bloke that you'd walk straight past if you saw him in the street. But I think people are really starting to now take note. So it deserves so much more respect. Internally, the Lions, he's rated extremely highly, and I rate him extremely highly as a super coach selection. So I am all for the Jared Lyons pick. If you can get him in, absolutely go for it. When Neil eventually comes in, does he affect Lyons? Maybe slightly because he'll be getting some of those clearances and hard ball, but I don't think that it's going to affect him to the point where he would have been a bad selection. Maybe five points uh, I'm predicting because Lyons is just a, such a consistent scorer and just really, really rate him as a player. Remember, I'm a Lyons supporter. Watch this bloke pretty closely each week. Uh, Titch, I do not rate at the moment. I said last week after that big score, don't get too excited. Don't trade him in. Yeah, if you did, it's pretty unfortunate because he went back to his old ways. The week before, 18 contested possessions. For some reason, on the weekend, three contested possessions. Playing outside the pack. Just not what Titch does. Not what his, you know, his, his tools involve. So... I don't get it. I'm disappointed. Just wish I wasn't an owner. So I'm not endorsing this Titch selection whatsoever. Clary, I'll endorse every day of the week. He's a buy it now. Break even 96. Really friendly price there. Yep, absolutely. Get this bloke in. Not much more to say. Huge, huge fan of Oliver. Andrew Gaff. Look, I'm not a huge fan of him. You know, more of an outside role. And I'll talk about someone with sort of an outside role in a minute. The man below him who I... Yeah, have a massive man crash on, to be quite honest. But yeah, Gaffey, 117. Great three-round average, 546. If you compare that to the three-rounder, it's looking pretty friendly. But for me, you look at that season average, it's only 98. So not one of those reliable mids that's going to be right up there. So certainly pass on him. Now, Huey McCluggage, according to some people, leading the Brownlow medal count at this stage of the season, if he doesn't get a wing spot in the All-Australian team this year, then it's an absolute joke. He must be a shoo-in to claim his first blazer, I think. The consistency is now there with Hugh, not accumulating a ridiculous number of possessions, but basically every time he does get the ball, he uses it well. Elite decision maker, got a wonderful football brain, and apart from a lack of blistering speed, every other aspect of his game, I think, is close to elite. It didn't seem like Hugh was going to be available at pick three in the draft and looked like lines were destined to select Benny Ainsworth, but thanks to Essendon and GWS for passing on him, Stephen Canole and the rest of the team just said, thank you very much. Absolutely wonderful. Couldn't call his name out quick enough. And I think Ainsworth was actually mouthing off a little bit to Huey on the weekend. And look, no offense to Benny Ainsworth, but he wouldn't be fit to polish Clugger's shoes at the moment. But uh, look, I've followed Huey's career extremely closely and had many chats with him over the years at functions, family days, training days, you know, all that sort of stuff, and have really noticed his change in body shape. He's worked hard to build up his strength, can now break tackles, stand up when he was getting tackled himself, and there's no easy pushover like he was at the age of sort of 18 to 20. And uh, I did mention as well in the podcast the other night with George that similar to Scott Pendlebury, he just always seems to have time and space. But the unfortunate thing is that at his price point, there are some other options. You know, you're paying 10K more for a Clary. Uh, you know, 40K, I know you may think that's a lot for Jared Lyons. You know, 35K more for a Bont. Yeah, I just probably can't condone the pick given the fact that there are other options just below or just above his price point that I think are probably safer, more inside options. But yeah, if, if this bloke plays full-time inside mid, I would select him with an, yeah, would not even think about it, would not think about it, would just get him into my side, but unfortunately, yeah, plays on the wing, the attacking side of the wing, which is good, Robo takes that defensive side, but uh, Huey McCluggage, probably not this year, but in the future as an inside player, 100%.
Timmy Taranto, he's made me look a little bit silly. Thought he was a trappish type player, but 120 for a three round average. If you started with him, it's actually worked out really well for you, I think. But yeah, what was interesting, only 10 of 29 CBA. So is that gonna be a concern moving forward? Yeah, maybe we'll have to just have to wait and see. Uh, Ollie Wines never really looked at this pick, to be quite honest, just throwing a name out there, really. Duncan, I have to give him more respect, but still, there's just something that doesn't feel right about him. 115 for a three-rounder, 119 on the season. Absolutely phenomenal, right up there. But for some reason, I just don't have him in my top eight to 10 mids by season's end, even though the numbers suggest that he is certainly there at the moment. Andy Brayshaw, 111 for a break even. Well, I've had him for three weeks now. Had two really nice weeks the first week and the previous week. And in the middle, yeah, really disappointing score against Brisbane. Things just didn't go right. But he was back to his best and absolutely wrapped. I think that he will end up to be a really solid selection at that price. Be prepared as always for a lower one here and there. But uh, yeah, at this stage, I'm a really happy owner. Just unfortunate that he's got that tricky round 14 pie. And Jack Steele, do you get him in this week? Well, I've got the buy now symbol along with the binoculars because I think that you can wait another week. And ideally, that's what I would actually be doing because, look, he does come up against the Doggies midfield. Yeah, they hog a lot of the points in the midfield, the Dogs, as we know. So it may be a tougher week for Jack Steele. We don't know what his role is going to be. Look, you know, you may think that there's no way that he's going to tag or get close to Bond. Who really knows? They may just go head-to-head, -head, you know, and... It'd be less of a tagging role, but, you know, both look to attack when they can. So, look, I'm not too sure with uh, what well, what's going to happen with Jack Steele and Bont on the weekend. And we're just predicting that that'll be the matchup, I suppose. But, yeah, you could get him in certainly at 5.69. We were looking to pay 6.50 at some stage during the season. So, yeah, I think he's a fine buy now if you want. But personally, I would wait the extra week. Cam Guthrie, what a superstar. I'm not sure if he's running with Dreddies or if he just hasn't brushed his hair for the last 12 months. But look, either way, he's giving all Australian selectors no choice but to give him a blazer this year. Talk about two-way running. This bloke is an absolute war horse. And he really does set the standard for the rest of his teammates. And he's had the ball in a string this year. Similar to Jared Lyons. May not get the plaudits like other teammates, like your Danger, Selwood, Duncan and co. But that won't worry him. I don't think. I'll be the first one to admit that after the first, what, three weeks, I still wasn't convinced and I didn't think that he could maintain the red hot start to the season, but I was wrong, plain and simple. When predicting my top 10 averaging mids pre-season, I did have this fella, nah, nowhere near the conversation. Just did not have him in the conversation, but he's made some other super coach top liners like your Tom Mitchell just look mediocre. So... I feel really sorry for the crumb, as Guthrie, it was his, his, his pre-season pod, uh, was Cam Guthrie, but unfortunately didn't go through with the pick. And in years past, he's played a lockdown role at times, but to be honest, I think it's time for opposition teams to consider playing a lockdown player on him. Just refuses to go the, below the ton, does Guthrie, and I really, really want him in my side. So if you want to get him in, I think he's certainly a buy now. Now, does danger affect him when he comes back into the side? Possibly, because I think he had a 70-odd score and a score around the 100. So it's a slight possibility, but the way he's going, you just can't deny the form. I'd love to have him in my side. Trav Bo, getting a little bit older now. Uh, break even of 120. Okay, but don't love the pick. Tuke Miller. I'll tell you what, a sneaky pot option I may highly consider. I'm going to leave it there with Tuke Miller just for now. In the next couple of weeks, yeah, I'll talk a little bit more about him. Tell you what, Gold Coast missed him on the weekend. Uh, Jay Gray Mira, not a huge fan of him. Just durability is a concern. Track, I tell you what, you may be able to get him under 500k if he keeps going the way that he is. So maybe after the buy as your last midfield upgrade, maybe Christian Petraka. Five, yeah, probably towards the end of the season after the buy. Trelaw, I don't like. Zeret, he's been pretty good to be honest, this season, particularly the last five weeks, not including last week where he just got tagged out of the game by Sarong. So really, really disappointed with that score, particularly being a Zeradona myself. So Zerat, yeah, I think he's still okay to get in, but 
at that price and with that break even, you'd probably want to wait. Jack McRae, now the same as him, so his break even certainly in the red compared to his three round average is the correlation that his scoring has declined when Josh Dunkley's gone out of the side. I'm not too sure, but I don't think his role's changed too much. He's still doing a lot of what he's done, still racking up the pill as well, 30 plus possessions. So I think he's okay to get in really at any stage, but maybe just wait the extra week, I think, if you can. Uh, Sam Walsh, again, love this bloke, top eight midfielder for mine, 151 as a break even. So you probably don't want to look to get him in this week. You could wait a week, get him a little bit cheaper. But yeah, look, 20 out of 26 CBAs. Yeah, he's a main man at Carlton at the moment. Love the pick. And I've, well, haven't, I won't say locked, but I'm pretty confident that he'll be a top eight mid by season's end. And Mundy and Salwood just got the Mr. Burns symbol on them. Look, they're old men. Had wonderful seasons to date, but I just think that it will start to slow down. And have we seen the start of that decline in scoring? I'm not too sure. I wouldn't go that far, but uh, yeah, I wouldn't be expecting these guys to keep up with the real top liners. On to the midfielders, 250 to 500k. Really not a lot to see here. Look, I wouldn't recommend really bringing any of these blokes into your side. Zach Tui, 59% of the kick-ins, low break even, but really, you're going to get Zach Tui in the midfield? I don't think so. James Jordan, absolutely hold this bloke. Break even of only 34, three round average of 91. No reason in the world to suggest that he won't go around that mark again this week. That's what I'm hoping. That's what I'm expecting anyway. Definitely hold James Jordan, I think, ideally, up into the buys, and then most likely flip him then. But yeah, love this bloke. Great role. 12 tackles on the weekend as well. So not only did he find the ball, yeah, he laid tackles, put pressure on. That's exactly what you want to see. So the other thing that I did mention, I think my round review was, you know, his disposal efficiency was down, but I did notice a couple of those kicks were real get out of Dodgeville kicks from a defensive line. So just booted out there just to get it out. There's a lot of pressure on him during the time. So yeah, you can't mark him too harshly during those particular situations. So just keep that in mind as well. Yeah, could have been easy 100 plus. Really nice score, I think, from him. Row bottom, I think he's a bit of a trap. We've seen him sort of go okay before and uh, just hasn't worked out. Swallow, a real pod, but you're not really interested, I don't think, in a David Swallow. Crouch, I just think's a trap. Uh, durability is a major concern for me. Jai Simpkin had a massive game over the weekend, 24 out of 29 CBAs, so finding himself right in the action. Season average now of 92, which looks a whole lot healthier all of a sudden, doesn't it? Three round average of 109, but remember it's including that massive score. Do not like this pick whatsoever. Ward's a trap, I think. You know, Cement Head, great player, goes in hard, but nah, not for super coach or our midfields. Jack Billings, the same, just never really liked him as a pick. Willem Drew, geez, he's been on fire the last three rounds. A three-round average of 115, break-even of 57. So 50% of the CBAs he's attending looks like he's got pretty good job security, particularly with the way he's been performing. So do you get him in midfield 456K? Absolutely not. Do not get trapped into this bloke. Do not bring him in, I don't think. And Errol, yeah, you've got to sell him. He's obviously going to be out for a while. Uh... Do you go down? Do you go up? Just team dependent? Either way, you need to get rid of this man, unfortunately. Again, no one that I really like here. Tom Green, think he's a bit of a trap. Cripps, just been a train wreck this year. Is he on the chopping block? Well, he did play an okay game over the weekend, but yeah, just a disaster, Paddy Cripps. Dyson Heppel, you probably just keep on to him for now. Maybe flip him or upgrade him during the buys. Carl Amon, really nice player as a pod. You really can't in midfield, though, can we? Same as Andy McGrath. Yeah, he's been playing okay. You know, 93 break even. It's right on that average for the season. So, yeah, wouldn't look to go there. Ben Cunnington, yeah, really nice three-round average of 115. He's not as old as we think he is. He just looks a lot older, I think. But, yeah, I'm just not interested in the pick. Now, this is... Uh, well, the next two players are players that I will talk about. I'll quickly go down to Adam Chera. Look, at the moment, his break even's 154, price at 430. So he's looking to go down 31K. He will be in the high 300K range, you'd expect, uh, by the end of this round. So certainly an option if you're looking to go ultra cheap because I rate him 
higher than any of the other picks that you'll see on the screen here. So if you're really, really desperate, you could, even if you're looking to go a quick cash grab. Uh, look, don't look at him this week, obviously, but next week we'll take a really close look at him in the next stock market video. But yeah, Tommy Powell, here's a bloke that we do need to talk about because he did have a disappointing score, his lowest score for the season over the weekend of 45, and that sent his break even all the way up to three figures, 106. So if he goes at a 77, that's his projected score, he's going down 12K. So that's not a disaster, is it? And I mean, there are certainly reasons to hold this man up until his buy, and then maybe look to flip him then. The trouble is, if you do that and then you flip him, then you know, you probably bring in a player, or you will be bringing in a player that's gonna miss one of the next two, or else do you just hold him throughout the whole buy period as just that player that has great job security. We know he's got a really nice ceiling. And again, if you had have asked me last week about Tommy Power, I was 100% just keep, 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 even keeping through that buy possibly, I'm not too sure. But yeah, I was a big fan of not trading Tom Power. But given the fact that break even is at a 106, let's just say he gets a 50. What happens then? So he's got a 45 and a 50 in his rolling average. Poor, that's going to plummet that price. And that break even will soar. So that's a concern that I've got with holding on to Powell. If he does throw in another stinker, which, yeah, I, I hope that he bounces back. Um, don't get me wrong, but there's no guarantee for that. So, yeah, it depends on your predictions. Like some people look at that and say, well, do you know what? He's hit 100 before. So there's no reason to say that he doesn't have the potential to do that this week. And sure, that, that's fine if that's your prediction. Not a problem whatsoever. But if you're on the other side of the fence and you're going, well, geez, there is a high chance, I think, of him going, you know, 40 to a low 50 type score. Then, yeah, next week, given the fact that that 45 from last week will still be there, yeah, that's going to absolutely, as I said before, skyrocket that break even. So there's two schools of thought. Personally, I think that I'll look to trade him to a man that's already had one price rise. But that will be a discussion for when I get to him. But yeah, Tommy Powell, there are certainly arguments either way. He's been brilliant for us this season. I don't think that it's a knee-jerk reaction looking to trade him out this week. You've got to look at the numbers and clearly uh, the numbers are in favor of trading him out of our sides. But arguments either way, personally though, looking to get rid of him at this stage. And on to the midfielders under 250K. Mr. RCD up the top had a really impressive game over the weekend, high 80 score for him. So if you had a jumped on him last week, you would have been absolutely wrapped with that performance. Really did hit back in the second half and have a real impact on the game. A bit of a quieter first half, but isn't it great to see him just really improving week by week? So with RCD, there's a lot of questions around, is it too late to bring him into your side? And I think it's sort of team dependent in a way. But the big point this week is obviously that there are no other options around the 117, the 123k mark. You can go early on a couple of blokes like O'Connor, for example, from Adelaide, who we've seen get around the 40 mark in around 50% game time. Do you trust that pick though? Certainly I wouldn't do that. We've already seen what's happened for people that traded Frederick in a little bit too early, Lockie Jones, for example. Yeah, it's hurt people. And uh, we can't be affording, oh, we can't afford, sorry, to have these type of donuts, particularly coming up to our buy rounds. We do need cover. So with RCD, I think you'll certainly be around uh, up until the buy rounds. I think you'll be able to cover okay. Even when some of those blokes come back into the side, I don't think he'll be all at once and he'll just be kicked out of the role that he's currently playing. And I've gotten the note section, and this is the thing that I'm really focusing on, 24 out of 29 CBA. So he was their most preferred midfielder right there in the thick of it. So we know the attack as well. Did hit the scoreboard, which was also awesome. He contested possessions, which are nice. So yeah, given the fact that there are no real other options, I'm looking to go out power and possibly in RCD. But at the same time, this could go really wrong because look, if he goes around the 50 mark, 60 mark, there's not a whole lot of money to be made on him. But in my situation last week, I did get Poulter in and I did grab Aaron Hall. Hall rose by about 40K. So I've got to keep that into perspective, sorry, as well, that I did make 
a, a fair investment last week. So yeah, I can stomach that a little bit easier. And I just don't see a whole heap of rookie talent on the horizon. So if you don't grab RCD this week, obviously it's too late and I'm loath to pay the price. But I think with the current circumstances that we find ourselves in, without having to take a risk on a first gamer, I think that this is probably the most logical pick for me. Looking to go 40k if you can go around a score of 70. So yeah, I like his short-term job security and... My plan is to play him on field in place of power. So I don't think I'm going to lose out too much there by playing RCD on field in place of power, but I'm making a fair chunk of money, which is going to help me to make my next upgrade. So uh, RCD, I still think that it's okay team dependent. Burns, probably not. Yeah, the ship sailed on him. Brun, really slow burn. You just don't look to get this bloke in. If you've held on to him, I don't know why. Maybe just through desperation like people still got Brockman so yeah I can probably understand it but uh, yeah just keep on to him for now hope he gets another game and rises a little bit of money Lockie McNeil yeah no reason to trade him out yet he's been pretty solid just keep watching him when the time's right get him out maybe just before his buy uh, Sam Berry hit back on the weekend so he gave his best score in a while the week that I traded him out but I've got no regrets about getting him out but yeah handy for current owners there Lazaro, slow burn as well. Not a great starting rookie. Naish, now nah, absolute poo on him. Look at his average, 17. Now that's not his fault. He's been the sub, I understand, but absolutely not. Do not get him into your side. And Spuddy Dow, why is he still on your side if you got him? The potato is there for Spuddy. On to the rocks. Paul Hunter hasn't been here in a little while, but given the fact that Rowan's gone down, look, does he come into calculations? I'm really not too sure, but... Thought I'd put his name out there anyway. Certainly don't look to bring him in, I don't think. But, yeah, who knows if he gets a couple of games. May generate some cash, but, yeah, I don't think so for mine anyway. Jordan Sweet, well, he's already raised, what's that, about 50k now. Still got a break even of negative four. Not sure when Steph Martin gets back into the side. But, look, you could go there if you want. But there's just really no points with I don't think, personally. Uh, Bailey Williams, a ruck forward. So this bloke is on the bubble. A couple of years ago, was it the year before, we were taking a pretty close look at this fella, but didn't quite make as much cash as we would have liked in the end. But has that DPP status, under 200k, is averaging 51 over a couple of games now. So with a projected score of 47, he's only going to go up about 15k. So you may like him for that DPP swing, but... I'm not sure what his job security is like moving forward, and I couldn't recommend him personally. Now, Matty Flynn, there's arguments for and against trading this bloke. We talked a little bit about this in the Q&A session with George, but look, it's really team dependent. Personally, I really want to see another price rise from him because his break even still only 16, and his projected score, again, take it with a grain of salt, but that's 96. So he's got another 35K in him if he can go around the ton. So... That's going to be really handy, 35k, I tell you what. So I'm hoping that he plays this week, and then I may look to flip him just before his buy, I think. Uh, Thil Thorpe, uh, again, a ruck forward, but you've missed the boat on him. Toddy Goldstein, I've got the Mr. Burns symbol on him because he is an old man, but a three-round average of 110 is pretty nice for him. Sean Darcy, the young sort of buck. Well, not really young. You know, he's a big boy, isn't he? Sean Darcy, really different sort of body shape, but 111 for a three-round average. You know what I feel about these Ruckman, though. Tom Hickey, shout out to him. I do it every week. I shout out him every week because he's just had a terrific season. So a season average of 106 and three-round average of 110. That's been great uh, for Tom Hickey this year. Nick Nat, yeah, can't really give him a shout out. Look, three-round average of 111, 105 for the average. Very similar to Hickey, but you paid a lot more for Nick Nat at the start of the year. Uh, Nank, just a pod throwing it out there. Paddy Ryder, you know, does he score at a higher rate given the fact that Marshall is out? I'm not too sure if someone like a Hunter, as we mentioned before, comes in or not. But surely he's got to have a little bit more responsibility in there. So are you willing to do it? Oh, I'm not personally. Uh, there's probably no reason to get him in. And these two men, well, you've got to have them. Look, we've been a little bit disappointed with Maxi. Can't believe he's gone all the way down to 628k. That is an absolute steal for Maxi, even with his break even of 146. He can always do that, but look at that three round average. You just didn't think that we'd see this from Max Gorn at any stage of the year. A 97 as a three round average. So if for some reason 
you're still running with just say god forbid like a flynn at r2 surely you couldn't still be at this stage i don't think and well and be going too well anyway but yeah max gorn this week or the next is going to be very very hard to pass up i know that he's got that bad buy but at the same time surely you know he's got to start getting those 130 plus scores again jackson probably comes back into the side this week i thought given the fact that jackson was out that Gorney would go one of those 140 plus type scores you know pitney isn't the best he's certainly not the worst ruckman in the comp but i thought that the planets were just aligned for maxi to have a really big game but unfortunately that wasn't the case you know 117 it's okay but it's not what we want or expect from maxi gorn most weeks so is that going to be the norm look probably put him down for maybe a 125 average i think at this stage for the rest of the year until we see him hit some form again but remember he's got a massive massive ceiling and we all need this bloke in our side i'll have the must have symbol on him every week and brody grundy down the bottom well he's got a big break even there of 163 so you probably don't look to get him in this week i don't think but Look, if you haven't got him, I think most teams do. But if you haven't, in a week or two, or even after the buy, if you can hold out for that long, I suppose, just getting him in. You've got to have these two blokes. I just need to stop repeating myself every week, I think, in the rucks. On to the forwards, 500k plus. Now, I do have the buy now, symbol on, Dane Zorko. Look, well, it's either him or Jack Zebel from this lot of forwards, isn't it? Because you've got Dunkley, gone. Zach Butters, gone. And Danger, gone. George did mention the other night, though, that Danger will most likely be available to play again after his buy. So that probably means that we do need to start planning for Danger. Well, given the fact that he's available in our forward lines and the forward line has just been absolute carnage this year, then I just think that you've got to plan for him. So currently at 611,900 with a break even close to 200 at 198. Surely he's got to get to at least a 550 mark, you'd think. Who knows how he's going to come back? Yeah, you know, will he score well? Will he come out with a bang, or will he be a little bit rusty, similar to someone like a Lockie Whitfield, who we're hoping will come good in the next month or two? So, yeah, with Danger, you've definitely got to get him in. I think um, we don't know, or we can't really predict what his price is going to be. But there you go. If you get to 122, he's going down 33k. So that's around the 580 mark, and who knows what it's going to be the week after? Still pretty high, I think. So. Definitely plan to get Danger in. But look, Dane Zorko, I wasn't a fan of him at the start of the season. I'm still not a huge fan of him at the moment. But with his numbers, look, over the last five weeks, his lowest score is a 92. Gone over the ton every other time. And mind you, it's just around the ton. So 101 against Essendon, 102 against Carlton, that 92 against Port, 105 against Frio. So all around that mark, really consistent type scoring. And then bang, that 140 against the Gold Coast Suns. And I think that Zorks was absolutely stoked that Tuke Miller didn't play. Because, uh, yeah, he's just always a thorn in Zorko's side, every uh, Q clash. So, uh, yeah, do, do I endorse the pick? Well, I've got the buy now symbol on him because there's just no one else really is there that's even available from this price range. You do have J Jack Zebel, uh, who is starting to have a few more question marks on him now, given the form and the role of Aaron Hall down there in the north back line but as you see there's still 75 percent of the kick-ins over the weekend that's still a good sign for zebel so i've got no plans to trade him out you could have a wacky plan even to trade him out to a premium midfielder he's around that price isn't he but if you're lucky enough to have that many trades to be able to do that then well done and good luck to you i certainly don't to be able to pull off any type of a move like that so uh yeah look so back to zorko look what i like about the pick is the fact that he has been scoring consistently. So between the 90 and 105 mark, even the 100 to 105 mark, to be quite honest. And then obviously that lower score with the 92, which is a good lower score, particularly for a forward. And then that high score for the year with the 140. So don't get too excited with these 140s. It's certainly not going to happen every week. And another concern I have is when Lockie Neal comes back into the side. So it, it was well stated at the start of the year. You know, Zorko said in his own words, he said himself that he was looking to take ownership of the forward line, play a real leadership role down there, work in tandem with Charlie Cameron, really excited to be working alongside Joey Danaher as well. So that was all the talk pre-season. But obviously Rainey goes down and he was probably the man that was going to spend a lot more time in the midfield 
as compared to previous seasons. And uh, the other bloke was obviously Lockie Neal, who's not playing. So I think that's why Zorko's got some more midfield time, more responsibility there at the moment. I certainly see him going back to more of a forward role when some of these names come back. Um, and when I say some of these names, I include Jared Berry. I can't include Rainer. He's gone for the season. But Jared Berry is another one. So when Jared Berry and Lockie Neal come back, I think that will affect Dane Zorko. I didn't think it'd affect Jared Lyons because he's just a mainstay. That's his role in the midfield. Uh, that's not going to change. With someone like a Dane Zorko, that role can certainly change. And uh, so I wouldn't be expecting as many CBAs and midfield minutes going into the future once Lockie Neal and Jared Berry do return. So for now, I think it's a good pick and it will work out okay. That's why I got the buy now symbol on him. But yeah, expect that average to lower once we get a couple of other blokes back into the side. Uh, and the other blokes, you can't really say much, can you? Uh, Zebul mentioned before that some people may think of trading him out, doing a shifty move, bringing in maybe a premium midfielder because what are you paying? Probably 30K, 30 to 40 to 50K to bring in basically any of the midfielders that you you want. So it could be a move, but I don't have that luxury personally, as I said before. So not much to see here, but you can buy Zorko for now if you want. On to the forwards, 250 to 500K. Tommy Campbell, I did not give this man enough respect at the time when he was on the bubble, but look, the data suggested, I think he had between a 35 to 40 average when he was up before his first price rise. So there's no way that I could recommend him based off that. So he can't be too harsh, I suppose, by not looking at him too closely. But yeah, look, really impressive, particularly over the last three rounds, an average of 87, negative break even of 14, close to 300K. So look, if you had it jumped on him for some reason, and there wasn't many people that did, I don't know anyone personally that did, you would be pretty happy at this stage because if he goes around to 71, which is, look, 16 points, lower than his three-round average, 37K he'll be rising by. So, yeah, well, did not see this one coming. And, uh, yeah, really handy DPP. Jimmy Rowe, he's an absolute hold. Uh, projected to go up 29K if he can hit a score of 61 after a couple of 80s. That seems pretty realistic. Break even now in the negative. So, yeah, absolutely wrapped with this fella because I have had him on field the last couple of weeks and he has delivered. So, really, really happy with Rowie and no reason to trade him out at this stage. Probably the best move. And again, it's hard to predict these things, but ideally look to hold him even up until his buy and then flip him, I think, round 14. Jesse Hogan just got the trap on him. Just always injured. Something will happen, I think. Jordan Gowie as well. Just trap, trap, trap. Just yeah, would not look to go near this bloke. You look at that break even of Hogan 5. Look, Three-round average of 91, and, you know, Dugowie, break-even of 12, three-round average of 77, nothing right home about, but obviously very much in the green. Yeah, just don't get tempted, I don't think, because something will happen down the track, and you'll really regret it. They're at this price for a reason, I think, and, yeah, just don't look to go there. Scotty, I'd be holding Anthony Scott. I think he's really handy as that DPP swing, and ideally, I keep saying this as well, maybe keeping up until the buys. If you have to get rid of him, I suppose that you can, but he's shown they can get a 70-80 type score. Good job, security. There's played every week since round one. And break even of 29, certainly achievable. At a 66, he's going up about another 16K. So that will get him over the 300K mark. And that's been a huge win, I think, with Anthony Scott this year. Now, Bergman, look, I think he's on the chopping block. You look at that break even, 42, 65 for the three-round average. Look, the numbers aren't really different between him and Scott, but I suppose for me... Scott's probably got the better job security, even though Bergman has got pretty solid job security at this stage, but he's got that added DPP swing, which I like. So yeah, Bergman, if you want to get rid of him, he's on the chopping block. Same as Jermaine Jones, uh, 313K, three rounder of 87, getting towards that with a 45, but you can certainly keep him, not desperate to get off him, I don't think at this stage. Now, Aaron Hall, my man. So I brought him in last week and... Oh, look, it was a bit of a risky move. You needed guts to do it, or you needed to be a little bit crazy. I'm not too sure. Uh, or you did need to have a good read on the game. One of the three, I'm not sure, but uh, we'll see how it works out uh, into the short and long term. But, yeah, look, I just love his role. I don't love his durability history and all the rest, but he was just too good to ignore, I think, at just over 400K last week. Now, this week, 
he's 454k um you know break even of 47 i'd still buy him now i'd still recommend to buy aaron hall you have missed out in that price rise but most likely last week you might have doubled down for example and got polter Poulter, still don't know how to pronounce it and rcd so if you're in that camp and you have doubled down last week he's still an attractive price i think holy for what he will produce what he's got the potential to produce and i really do just love his role so i think there's still enough meat on the bone at this stage to get aaron hall in at a friendly price and can see him probably going around that 110 average for the rest of the season if he can stay on the park that's always a big question but i do endorse the aaron hall pick much better last week still okay i think this week jeremy cameron i've just got the roller coaster on him you'll get some really nice scores then you'll get some putrid scores uh break even a 47 three rounder of 82 Nah, just not for me. You can go there if you want, but yeah, just don't like the pick personally. Now, George gave us some great insight the other night on this next man, Nick Hind, and I tell you what, he's got me seriously thinking about him. Now, we look back at his scores from the start of the season, so a 77, 98, 85, 93, 102, 76, 89, 95, and a 127. Now, what we've finally seen from this man on the weekend is is a ceiling some type of a ceiling so a 127 clearly his highest score of the season and his next highest score is actually that 102 so only gone over the ton twice but you are getting scores of your 95 98 93 89 85 which certainly are not terrible scores or disaster type scores and then you've got your 76 and a 77 so Basically, he's shown that his floor's at about a 75 level and that his ceiling is, we won't give him 127, let's give him a 120 type. Now, I'm not saying that that's going to be regular, that 120 type score, but another thing JD did mention in the Supercoach Take podcast, uh, shout out to all those boys as well, um, is that this man is looking better each and every week. Now, JD's an Essendon fan, I believe, and he watches them pretty closely obviously going for the Bombers, and uh, he likes this pick, you know, not overly as confident as George is, I don't think, on the pick, but uh, yeah, look, for me, it's that consistency that I really like. Another thing George mentioned was the fact that he came, I think it was sixth in the equivalent of the VFL Brownlow, playing this exact role, so he does have good scoring history, I think it was a 110, he said that the average there, obviously different at AFL level, can you translate that? Well, looks like he has translated that form to the top level, because he's looking really exciting this year, you may say that the scores aren't too exciting, because you've only gone over the ton twice, but at the same time, you're getting a pretty safe bet here, aren't you, you know, we know that his role's not going to change, he's going to be there from week to week, sort of pumping out your hopefully 85 to 100 type scores is that going to be good enough for you well look his break even's 50 at the moment um 455k i'm hoping that we'll get to see that ceiling a little bit more often i think his confidence is growing from week to week as well i don't think Aston are a terrible side uh they're certainly an up-and-coming side and yeah I, I really agree with the boys that he should look to improve his output as the season progresses so I'm seriously considering this pick at the moment, and I've got the safe symbol there because I think that he's just going to be a really safe pick for that sort of 90 to maybe 100 type average at the best. Uh, Deb Robinson, so an interesting pick, 50% CBA attendance over the weekend. So, you know, you do have Matthew in there, who I've talked about, Jared Lyons, Mainstay, Zorko going through there, but 50%. That's not too bad. That's not too bad. So he's got that mid-forward status, a break-even of 59. I'd be looking to keep Dev at this stage. See how he goes against the Tigers. I can just throw him in there, see how the young man goes. You know, they're pretty decimated there at this stage. So I'd love to see us give Dev a bit more of a go in the middle. So we'll see if that happens. I'm not sure if it does, but at this time, yeah, I'd just look to keep him and then reassess him next week or two. Dusty, I've just got to buy now. I'm not going to talk too much about him. Look, you may say it's the name, but we did see him come back on the weekend. Concerns of the fact that he did get a heap of the ball, did kick the four goals, and his score was nothing like a monster score, you know, in the 120s. You know, we would have liked to see a 
140, 150 plus score, looking at those numbers anyway, looking at the raw stats. But we didn't get that, unfortunately, with Dusty. But what we did get was still a really solid score. His best score in a long time, to me anyway. You know, the eye test, he didn't look hampered by that foot injury, which is a really positive sign. And, you know, when, when I'm considering someone like Nick Hines at 455k and you've got Dusty there at 425 Geez, it's a bargain. And for all those people that started with him, which was, what, over 50% of the comp, and for those, yeah, I won't say unlucky people. Well, maybe unlucky, but, you know, I made the decision to bring him in before the start of round three, before the price rises occurred. Then, geez, you've really suffered with this pick. Um, yeah, I've torn my hair out with the dusty pick. But, yeah, you're getting him for such a bargain this week. And to be honest, I think that he really is just a bit of a no-brainer to bring into your side. Shy Bolton, obviously gone at this stage. Can't do anything with him. Uh, if you haven't traded him out, you're probably planning on keeping him, I'm guessing, because, yeah, last week was obviously the week to do that, I think. Uh, unless you wanted to just survey the options for another week and you had cover. Um, if that's the case and you haven't got a Dusty or an Aaron Hall, they're probably the two blokes I'd look to get in, uh, and a Nick Hind, probably third after that. Uh, Jarman Impey, just keep the watch on him. You know, you, you could maybe even bring Jarman Impey into your side. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I'm keeping him, you know, the F6 type position, I think. So if you want to get him in, you can. But after the buy, it'd be nice, wouldn't it? And Chad Warner, I think he's on the chopping block. Look, it's really up to you. You can keep him up until he's buy because when I say he's a reliable rookie, his job security is just almost second to none, maybe second to a Jordan Butts, but can't think of too many other rookies that are ahead of Warner in regards to job security. So I'm still more than happy with holding on to him at this stage. But at the same time, if you can get him up to a Dusty, for example, this week, or an Aaron Hall, as I, I keep on mentioning the same names, uh, a Zorko even, one of these type of players, then I would, yeah, not, not recommend it, but... Um, yeah, I'd say that, yeah, that's a fine move. That's a fine move also. So it really is team dependent. You know, is he a F6? For some people, he still could be your F4, which makes it a little bit dicier, particularly if you're not going up. But yeah, it's, it really is team dependent, this one. For me, I'm really not sure still what my trade plan is going to be, but there is a good chance that they will involve Warner going out of the side this week. And the next man, Isaac Heaney. He's caused a little bit of discussion this week in the Supercoach community because he's just pumped out a 110 after three previous scores of 44, 54, and 19. So people are thinking, look, is this bloke going to present us with a bit of value? And it depends on which way you look at it. For me, and if you listen to the podcast uh, with George, myself, and Spills the other night, You'll know how we all feel about this pick. We just wouldn't go near him. Look, he's the sort of bloke that you're just worried every time he fires up for a mark. What's going to happen to him? Is he going to land awkwardly? You know, break a hand, break an ankle, do something. He's just the sort of bloke that comes out with these weird sort of injuries that you just can't predict. But we can predict that most likely something will happen. We don't know what it's going to be. It'll probably be something wacky, as we said, but... We know that most likely something's going to happen to Heaney at some stage during the season again. Now, you may be looking at him and think, look, he's got that sort of proven premium history, particularly for our forward lines. You know, he's been up there for the top averages for a few years. He presents good value. Sydney a pretty good side this year. He's got the talent. He's certainly got the talent. And don't get me wrong, this pick isn't about Isaac Heaney's talent. It's about his durability and also his role in the side. You know, he, he plays up forward. Ideally, and we've been asking for years and years for him to do what Callum Mills is currently doing. And it's seen, you know, what it's done for Mills scoring. You know, it's really pushed him up into the elite category there, particularly for the defensive line. So, look, with Isaac Heaney, I just wouldn't look to go there. I've got the trap symbol on him, but the watch at the same time. So, look, if he gets another decent score this week, you may think, look, if he can stay in the park even for a month, it's possibly even a quick cash grab, you know, and then flip him before the buys again. He'd be pretty brave to do that, but it is a move you could look to do. I don't endorse it. I don't recommend it. But yeah, to you know, long story short, just I wouldn't go near Ward Zakini purely because of the durability risk. But you can, if you're desperate, maybe I'd certainly wait a week. You know, that break even seventy five. Even if he goes to one ten, 
you know, what's he going up? 10, 20K or something, still around the 360 mark. So it won't be the end of the world if he does that. Not just be waiting for at least one more week starter. If you're willing to do it, do not do it this week, I don't think. But, yeah, completely up to you. Tom Phillips, trap. Joey Danaher. So, again, if you want a more of an in-depth discussion, check out the podcast because I did talk a little bit about Joey Danaher. I think that Dan McStay's done wonders for him once he's come into the side. Allowed Joey to roam a little bit more up the ground. And Dan McStay just provides us with wonderful structure. But we do have a couple of blokes down our defensive line with Froggy Lester, unfortunately going down in his 150th. Not super coach relevant, and most people wouldn't even know who I'm talking about, but he's a terrific bloke, leader at the club, uh, just a really unheralded type of player. And uh, Darcy Gardner was the other one. Again, not super coach relevant, but what does that mean? You know, is there going to be a shift? I don't know if we've got too many blokes that are putting their hand up, you know, key position-wise, or key back-wise anyway, in the resis. So, look, we may not even need to do anything, given the fact that Richmond may run with a bit more of a smaller forward line, maybe look to get another small defender like James Madden in. Possibly he comes in this week, James Madden, not too sure. So just keep a look out for that. But uh, yeah, we're talking about Joey Danaher, won't we? Yeah, I got, geez, a little bit off track there, didn't I? But look, in regards to if he's a keeper or not, oh, look, a lot will have to go right, I think. But at this stage, you know, a three-round average of 95, 80 at the moment, definitely keep him up until the buys at least. And then you could look to flip him. But in the short term, there's no reason why you look to get him out of your side, to be quite honest. Just keep him for now and then just keep reassessing, I think, as the season progresses. Chad Wingard, I've always got as a trap. Just don't like him as a pick. Perkins and Cox, so both got break-evens of 82 now. So season average uh, for Perkins, 52. Cox, 54. So extremely similar numbers there. Cox with lower three-round average, but... Yeah, they're both looking to start losing cash now. So ideally, you look, it's up to you. You can keep them up until they're buyers if that's a strategy that you want to use. But yeah, they are in the chopping block because if you look at that break even compared to their season average and the three-round average, they're certainly looking to lose cash this week. Uh, Zach the Rat Bailey, so his break even should actually be in the green there, lower than the 89 three-rounder. But uh, look, yeah, it's a pod pick, but I just can't endorse it. Love him as a player though. Peanut Laddams will never endorse him. Just want to chuck the peanut symbol in there for a week. But he comes in and uh, look, yeah, just, just don't go near him. Can't trust him. Bailey Dale. So, yeah, look, he's one of those picks that you could get into your side, but it's still a little bit risky for mine. You know, he's got, what, a break even of 95, three rounder of 96, 91. Look, is a pretty safe option, I think. But, yeah, I like George's man. A bit of a safer option, I think. Still side bottom. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of this pick, particularly with his round 14 buy. Maybe after that, we'll see. Jack Darling as a pod, you know, kick five goals in a quarter. Phenomenal. But at the end of the day, break even of 106, three-rounder of 102. Yeah, you wouldn't look to jump on there. Better options, I think. Toby Green, well, you've got to get rid of him now, don't you? That's really unfortunate. And Rowan Marshall. Yeah, look, I'm not looking to get this guy in at any stage. I'm not planning for him now. I always was planning for him, um, basically every week up until this week. And now it's just, yeah, he's absolutely ruled out for me because I'm worried that this thing will just keep flaring up and I just wouldn't risk it, not even after the buys now. Uh, yeah, just not a fan of this pick. I was, yeah, I'm, I'm, look, I'm a big fan of Marshall as a player, but given his foot issues, just way too risky for me. And Tex, not even on the chopping block, just sell. You have to sell, I think. Uh, things are going south very quickly for the Texans. So I would absolutely jump ship this week while you can and either go down or up. And we'll finish off with the forwards under 250k. The man up the top, Caleb Poulter, Poulter, however you pronounce this bloke's name. I like him anyway. He's a mid forward, now priced at 174000 100 with an average of 66, which is really nice for a rookie at this stage of the season, I think. Last week was the week to jump on this bloke, but there are a few questions going around the community about whether or not it is too late to invest in this fella. Now, I suppose it's a similar story to RCD. If you're desperate, I suppose you probably can. Look, if he's going 66 again, which is his average for the season, he'll look to go up close to 50K. So that'll be sending him at about 225K, which would be really nice. I've got 
the ship and the buy it now. So if you're desperate, you can buy them now. But the ship may have already sailed. If not, it is certainly, certainly sailing after this week. So yeah, if it works for you and it works for your side, I suppose that you can. I'm not really for it. But at the same time, if I'm highly considering bringing RCD in, then yeah, what's the difference with looking at a Caleb Poulter? So yeah, if you want to do it, you can. But yeah, ideally, you're looking to upgrade this week rather than downgrade. Talk about not being able to pronounce, to, I can't pronounce the word, pronounce now. There we go. That's better. But uh, <laughs> this bloke, Matthew Owies, Owies, it, it reminds me of that there was a prank to a news station and um, they actually read out the names. It was Holy Fook uh, and I think it was Bang Dang Owie. And I always laugh about that. I, sh I should try to find it and um, put it in the description. But uh, yeah, Matthew Owies, Owies, whoever you say, this fella's name as well. He's looking to go up to about 23K if he can go around 47. Look, a decent type player, you know. Puts a bit of pressure on. Can hit the scoreboard, as we know. But uh, look, the ship has sailed on this pick. We're not going to uh, sorry, pay 167900 for this fella. He's, yeah, just, just not worth it at this stage, I don't think. Uh, Cameron Zerha, I've just got the trap symbol there. Break even of five. You may think, yeah, really great game over the weekend, but don't get sucked into this pick. No way at all. Alec Waterman, will he come back in? I'm not sure. you just got the job security there, praying that he comes in at some stage for some more cash gen, ideally to cover for a buy or two as well. That would be awesome. Finn McRae, I've got the poo symbol on me. I hate doing that, but really, you look at his average, it's 34. You know, break even of 22. Yeah, just been a failed pick, unfortunately, at this stage. And not even really good for loop because they play some early games, Collingwood. Jai Farah, yeah, well, he's been a lot better than R2 at the end of the day, hasn't he? But, uh, yeah, hasn't been a super pick. Ship has sailed on that. Probably, yeah, just keep on to him at this stage. Brockman, I've got the poo on him. Don't know when he comes back in, if at all. I've actually gone the double poo on Oliver Henry. I'm sorry, Oliver. But, mate, your break, is, your break even is 33 and it's almost double your score there. Your average, an average of 16 for the season, Ollie Henry. And at 120K currently, he's looking to lose 7K. So he's looking to go 113. We may see a super coach player under the 100K mark. Do we jump on him just for a bit of a laugh? Not for a laugh, but financially, for some sort of a loop, I'm not too sure. If you're desperate for money, geez, how low will this man go? Um, look, I think he could have a solid future, but things just haven't gone right for him this year in a super coach sense, you know, sub, you know, all, all this type of stuff. But uh, yeah, just it's <laughs> just an interesting talking point, I think, Ollie Henry. Don't mean to rag on the young man or anything like that, though. Uh, Bo McCreary, well, look at his break even there 46. It's one over the three round average there. Could be on the chopping block, uh, but I rate his job security. Probably keep him up until the buy, I think. Um, if not, yeah, okay to chop, I think, at this stage. And I've just got the sell on Braden Campbell. I don't know what's going on this bloke. I think he may be injured, but get rid of him and, yeah, bring someone else in. So that's it for this week, guys. Good luck with all of your decisions. What am I doing? Well, I'm still really not sure. Am I going to get a Nick Hind, a Dane Zorko, upgrade the forward line? Or will I go full on and get a Guthrie Lions, Bont and Pally type? I've got a lot of options up my sleeve, but a lot of that does revolve around Pow Out and RCD in. So we'll see how we go. Nothing set in stone at this stage. Many, many options. Good luck with your trades anyway, and I'll see you soon in the next one. Cheers, bye.